Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and with sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Thank you, Rachel. Tonight, uh, we are starting a new series in uh, Luke's Gospel, Food for the Soul. Food for the Soul. Uh, Is your soul satisfied, I wonder, uh, with the food that you are eating at the moment? The Franciscan uh, New Testament scholar, Robert Karras, says that in Luke's Gospel, uh, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. Or to that, I would add, uh, talking about a meal. Uh, Jesus really likes food. Uh, Jesus says elsewhere in Luke that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. So uh, this series is going to be nutritious, and hopefully delicious, as uh, we start in Luke. But it also includes uh, what you might not expect. And that's why today I'm speaking to you about a meal of grace. A meal of grace. Now, grace is not a perfunctory prayer uh, that you pray at the beginning of a meal. Grace is the substance of the meal. With apologies to the vegans here tonight, grace is the meat of the meal. And uh, it's, it's not to everyone's taste, I'm afraid. It's certainly not to the taste of the Pharisees that we encounter uh, here tonight in Luke chapter 5. And the the Pharisees wanted to be pure and blameless before God. And uh, today they're taking issue with Jesus and with his eating buddies. Uh, In particular, tax collectors and sinners, the lowest of the low. And we meet Levi. Uh, Levi, he is a tax collector for the Roman forces. And if you can imagine a a Ukrainian official demanding tax rises and then uh, sending that money from Ukraine to Russia, that's about on the level here of of what Levi uh, is like to those around him. And Luke starts his gospel by saying uh, that he wants to write an orderly account of Jesus, an orderly account of Jesus. And, And where we come to tonight feels anything but orderly. And if you spare a, a thought for preachers up and down the country uh, uh, this, this week on, on just maybe some live and current examples on, on, on chaos and, and disorder, uh, perhaps with Van Gogh or with the, the economy or uh, the government, it feels a little bit like uh, we're in a slow, snow globe uh, tumbling down a hill. And uh, I'm, I'm at the moment uh, devouring uh, this uh, book that has hit the bestseller list uh, called Faith, Hope, and Carnage. Faith, Hope, and Carnage. And it's a conversation between a Nick Cave and a, a friend of his. And Nick Cave is the rock star. Uh, like me, he's also from Melbourne in Australia and now lives in the UK. I think that's around about where our similarities end. Although he is quite tall and dark features, but there we go. Um, and uh, he has lived a wild life, to say the least. And uh, he, he has a certain insight into the world, a certain insight that comes from uh, investigating, from creativity, but also from immense suffering. In this book, he talks about how uh, two of his sons have tragically died. And he also speaks about the the self-righteousness of religious people and uh, the self-righteousness of atheists alike. But he also speaks about how how he's always been drawn to Jesus Christ and that he would now consider himself uh, to be a believer in God. And he's asked about when he was much younger and when he was looking in at faith. And he's asked the question, uh, did you see religion as a way to give your life a degree of order? 
He says, no, I don't think that's right. I had a major taste for havoc. I might wake in my hotel room surrounded by the detritus of a heavy night on the road. Empty bottles, drug paraphernalia, maybe a stranger in my bed. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> but also an open copy of Gideon's Bible uh, with passages underlined. And this is something like the scene that we find in Luke chapter 5. Jesus entering the mess of this world and looking for people. Looking for people who will be drawn to him. And the context is, is that in the previous chapter, uh, Jesus, he, he, he stands up in a synagogue in Nazareth and he unfurls the words of Isaiah where he announces that, that his kingdom is on its way. And what does this kingdom look like? Well, uh, look at what he does next. He, he, he heals a man, and worse than that, he proclaimed forgiveness of sins. And so the Pharisees, they are watching Jesus very, very closely. And by the next chapter, we read that, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Our friend Robert Karras says that in Luke's gospel, Jesus got himself killed because of the way that he ate. By eating a meal with specific people, Jesus is, is, he, he is reframing the understanding of, of who's in and who's out and turning the, the, the understanding of what God is like, what the Pharisees think God is like on its head. Have a look at not only at the, the, the way that Jesus eats, but also the way that Luke writes. Uh, we, we see here in this passage only six verses. Only six verses. So, so every word there matters. But he also uses a structure uh, called the inclusio, where the, the first and the last verses bracket are what this passage is about. So have a look at the first and last verses of our passage. In, in verse 27, it says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And then in verse uh, 32, it says, uh, Jesus says, I have not come to call. So the, the, the passage begins and ends with Jesus uh, calling people to follow him. And the, 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 the word that we use for that is discipleship, discipleship. And uh, the first time actually we see Luke introducing the word disciple into his entire gospel is right here in, in verse 30. So, so reading this passage is a, is a very tightly concentrated, a very specific description of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And people want to know, what is their calling in life? People everywhere asking, what's my calling? Why am I here? Why have I been put on planet Earth? And each and every one of us, you and me, we each have a specific purpose and a specific calling. And if you want to know what your calling is, then this is where you start. And firstly, we see that it's the call to follow Jesus. The call to follow Jesus. Let me read that verse 27 again. Uh, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Now call me Captain Obvious, but it's worth pointing out, it's worth saying that this call is a call to follow Jesus. It's not a call to follow your ideology. It's not a call to follow a particular leader or stream, but it's the call to follow Jesus Christ. And for the political ones here tonight, and for those of you on the right, this means not being more interested in Jordan Peterson than it means being interested in Jesus Christ. And those of you on the left, don't be more interested in climate change than changing the climate of your heart. Don't be consumed by the culture wars if really you are at war with God because of the culture that is going on in your heart. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call to, to those who, who value certain values, even value-cracking preaching, but, but don't value and don't respect and honor the image of God in fellow sisters and brothers and their hearts and their bodies. 
And you can, you can be like a Pharisee and you can keep uh, pointing the finger at others and their issues. But being offended will keep you from Jesus Christ. I get it, Jamie, I get it, Jamie. I, I need to be like Levi, I need to be like Levi instead of the Pharisees. Well, do you know what happens to, to Levi? What happens uh, to, to Levi? The, the curious thing is that as soon as, as soon as Levi gets up and follows Jesus Christ, Jesus seems to follow him. And he has Jesus over to his house, hosting him. It's like, it's like Levi is saying, Jesus, follow me. And Jesus is looking. He's on the lookout for people who will show him hospitality. In Revelation, Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. Jesus' desire is to be close to you and me. But in the church in Laodicea that, that Jesus is writing to, Jesus is not even in the building. He's not even in the room. And this is supposed to be a, a Christian church. And ultimately, only you will know if you are actually following Jesus Christ. If Jesus has a place at the table, or if Jesus even has a place in the building. Going to church, going to church, going to a connect group doesn't make you or me any more a Christian than being in McDonald's makes us a Big Mac. Maybe there are some of us who are, who are too busy on church rotors to let Jesus get a look in at your life. And in your workplace, in my workplace, do, do you and I, do we have the courage like Levi does in his workplace to listen to Jesus? To let Jesus look at you and to respond to him? Or are, are, we, stuck, are we stuck on the, on the same loop the, the same track of our colleagues, their fears, their priorities, their practices. What happened? What happened in that moment when Jesus called out to Levi and Levi responded? I wonder what Levi saw in Jesus Christ. The mercy in the eyes of Jesus Christ, a preview of the cross, that Jesus himself would be judged, that Jesus himself would be shamed in order that he could let Levi in. Levi knew what it was to be rejected. He knew what it was to be shamed and he knew what it was to be judged. And he, he, he saw something in the eyes of Jesus. That Jesus knew what was coming. I wonder what Jesus saw in Levi when Jesus looked at Levi. A traitor, a deceiver, a sinner, unclean. The list goes on and on and on. And yet Jesus saw Levi. He saw him completely, and he loved him. In verse 27, we see that Jesus, he, he sees and calls the outsider. That's the, that, that verb there that Jesus saw, to see, it's as if Jesus, he is looking into you. He's looking inside of you. And Jesus, he sees you and me. He sees us completely. He sees us warts and all. And yet he still says, I want you. I wonder, have you ever seen Jesus look at you like that? I remember being 11 years old uh, back in Australia on uh, a, a camp and uh, one evening around a campfire and uh, someone was reading a passage from the Bible and I, I just knew that Jesus was there. Not just in the words on the page but that Jesus himself was there and present and that he saw me and that he loved me. 
And all I could offer him was my youth, my inexperience, my sin. And yet Jesus called out to me that night. And I remember uh, back in uh, the dorm, back in the room with the other kids later that evening with floods of tears coming down my face. And the priority in that moment was that, that this invitation was an invitation that was open to all people. And I just had to share that with anyone and everyone I could find. But the thing I, I want to point out to us tonight from my experience is that for me it was a very personal call. It was between me and Jesus. The Jesus he was calling Jamie Mulvaney. And it's the same for each and every one of us. Not Jesus calling your parents, not Jesus calling your church leaders, not Jesus calling your connect group leaders, but Jesus calling you. And this is a very personal thing, a very specific thing of you, what it means for you to follow Jesus Christ. And part of this call to follow Jesus uh, means to uh, leave everything, to leave everything. Verse 28, it says, Levi got up, left everything and followed him. And when Luke says that Levi followed him, it's as if he's writing uh, that, that, that Levi began to follow Jesus Christ. It's this uh, commencement and continuation of discipleship. But Levi, uh, he's left everything. He's left it all. And yet he knows that this is only the, just the beginning. Just the beginning of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't know fully where following Jesus would take him, but he did know that it would mean giving up his entire way of living and his, his entire way of being. When we think about what, what are sometimes described as, the, as the, the secular forms of salvation, that we look to in our lives, the, the secular ways that we try to, to, be, to be saved and to save ourselves. All the, the creature comforts, the expectations of living in this world, and ultimately our, our self-reliance, our self-dependence, our self-respect. And then every day, every day we have to let go of these things. We have to hand them over to Jesus and, and to follow Jesus and to keep on following him. This is an ongoing surrender because, because this is a call to repentance, to repentance. And the best way that I can describe repentance is just to do a complete 180, to do a total reverse and to head in the opposite direction of the way uh, that you're going, to leave everything. Verse 31, Jesus answered the Pharisees, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yes, Jesus came eating and drinking. He also came as grace and truth. And the, the, the tension in our culture, the tension in our culture that has so pharisaically set itself up as judge and jury, is, 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 is the tension between, between cancel culture, on the one hand, deleting people, and then also accepting people, that, that uh, a culture of permissiveness. You'll find the way you are, and don't you change a thing about yourself. But cancel culture and, and a culture of permissiveness, they are not the culture of heaven. And what Jesus has come to bring is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on planet Earth. And Jesus uh, meets us and accepts us just as we are. But he doesn't leave us that way. If we're just sort of going about our life as a Christian, but you know, we're finding actually I'm not really repenting of anything that much. I'm not really repenting of anything at all. I haven't repented in a while. And the question has surely got to come, am I following Jesus Christ? And when, when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses, point number one was that all of life is repentance. You and I, we do not graduate from grace. C.S. Lewis wrote, Christianity tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It has nothing, as far as I know, to say to people who do not know they have done anything to repent of and who do not feel that they need any forgiveness. And Jesus isn't able to do anything with you and me if we don't repent. That's the, that's the Pharisee's issue. Levi's sins, they, they stank to the sky, and yet he repented. And the Pharisees were apparently squeaky clean. 
And Jesus, he, when he was saying, I've not come to call the righteous, he's basically saying the, the so-called righteous. But Jesus, he knows this kind of righteousness doesn't really stack up. It's why, why Paul, a, a, a righteous man, said this. He said, I, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. On which basis are you living your life? On being wise in your own eyes or on faith and what Jesus Christ has done for you, following him? Because the problem with self-righteousness is it keeps us away from Jesus Christ. And Paul knows he's got to ditch all that stuff in order to know and to treasure Jesus Christ. And Jesus says another time to the teachers that you scan and you search the scriptures, but you refuse to come to me. The Pharisees, they think in this setting they are protecting scripture, but little do they know now this man, Levi, he will go on to write Matthew's gospel. He will go on to write scripture himself. Nick Cave uh, speaks about having a humility towards one's place within the world, an understanding of our flawed nature. We are losing that understanding as far as I can see, and it's often being replaced by self-righteousness and hostility. Ultimately, this is, this is hostility towards God from us. And so you and I have a choice. We have a choice of hostility or blessing. Over and over and over in Luke's gospel, we see that what's on offer to those who repent, who repent from their hostility towards God and choose Jesus Christ, is that they receive a blessing and forgiveness. There's blessing. There's freedom. There's joy. So in contrast to that, that self-righteous attitude of our age, sort of sucking the fun out of everything, an inability to have fun, an inability to have joy. But then, you know, there are those who are looking for fun, and yes, there's a there's fun social scene here at HDC, but we are called to be distinctive as followers of Jesus Christ, not, not consumers of, of cheap grace, you know, with our eyes wide open as we just walk headlong into sin and think, well, we can ask for forgiveness later. That kind of living, that, that's not freedom. That's not joy. That's sin that, that we settle for, that, that makes us settle for a less than life. It prevents us from seeing the wonder of who God is and what he wants to do in our lives. The question is, will you and I, will we, will we let Jesus step through the door of our lives. Sin is a sickness, and you and I need a doctor. And Jesus is not one of these doctors, the poor doctors at the moment who are run off their feet, sort of barking questions at you in a seven minute tops appointment. Now he, he wants to spend time with you. He has all the time in the world for you. And he wants to heal you. He wants to minister to you. He wants to be with you. He wants to dine with you. One of my favorite uh, scenes in, in, in film history is the, the dinner party scene in Notting Hill, uh, where Hugh Grant's character uh, brings Julia Roberts's character uh, to his sister's birthday uh, meal. And uh, they're sat at the table, and there's other people there, and they're all fighting over who gets to eat uh, the last brownie by saying, uh, by, by talking about how each other are the saddest act here. And, uh, and then Julia Roberts' character pipes up, and you know, apparently the most famous actress in the world, and they're all shocked that she wants to fight for this last brownie. And, and this most famous actress in the world, she, she unmasks her apparently perfect life. And she's real about the things that have happened to her and what life is like for her. And Jesus is essentially saying to you and me tonight, give up the act. Give up with the, the, the pretense and the show and tell me how you really are. 
and tell me who you really are. He wants to come in and, and minister to you and me and sit with us over a long meal and let the, let the wine and the conversation flow with his friend. And he's so much more than a friend. He's a doctor and he's a savior. I remember uh, arriving here at HCC about five years ago, a little over five years ago, and uh, I was supposed to be this sort of shiny new associate uh, minister. And uh, I remember arriving at the time, and I was um, really quite burnt out uh, from the way that I'd worked at a previous job, uh, and I was recovering from that. And then uh, within a week or two of arriving, uh, my girlfriend broke up with me uh, a few weeks before I was supposed to take her brother's wedding. And uh, then uh, on the evening before I was due to, to, to preach at all four services, I woke up on the bathroom floor having fainted um, from having gastro, and I lost over a stone of weight. And uh, I was unable to preach, I was unable to be introduced to all the Connect Group leaders uh, to that week. And uh, I, was, I remember thinking, I'm supposed to be one of the leaders here. But actually, I, at the moment, I really actually do feel like the saddest act here. And, and a lot of people were very patient with me, and Jesus slowly but surely uh, mended and repaired my, my heart and my soul and my mind and my body. But even more importantly than that, Jesus has in his kindness gone on and on and on, dealing with my sin, forgiving me and freeing me from the, those things that entangle me, and those things that hold me back. And, and whether your life looks like mine, whether your life looks like Nick Cave's, whether you think actually I'm doing a pretty good job of saving myself right now, tonight Jesus sees you. He sees all of you. He sees the real you. And he wants to heal you, to forgive you, and to eat with you. And tonight, all you and I have to say is, I'm sick, I need a doctor, and I sin. I need a savior. Will you open the door?